neighbor. I haven't even gotten to talk to you before, but Jennifer, thank you so much for participating in the Virtual Arts Summit. Thanks for inviting me. So what's new lately? Well, let's just start with like, what are you doing? So one of the things that I, I have been working on just recently is a call for art. Um, I'm artist in residence at Georgetown Hospital, and we thought it'd be fun in conjunction with World Collage Day, since I love collage, mm -hmm. to have a call for art where people could send in four by four inch collages. We would display them inside the hospital um, for World Collage Day. And then we would attach, we'll attach them to blank greeting cards to give to patients, caregivers, their families and hospital staff. I hadn't anticipated how appealing that would sound to people. It has been forwarded and published so many places that so far I have close to 1000 submissions. Oh, wow. The deadline is May 10th. Every day I spend about an hour just logging in all the art that's arriving. And what most people are saying is thank you. and I. It's sort of, um, it's a powerful message that artists or creative people can create something that then brings joy to others. And so people have just loved this idea. Um, yeah. And it's been, I made this with love. I hope this brightens someone's day. So it's sort of like the practical side of our, um, of what we do, you know, it's sort of fun to make art and then to think you could actually give it away and, you know, make someone's day. So it's been um, an unexpectedly big part of my life because I somehow thought maybe we'd get a couple hundred. <laughs> and I'm thinking, <laughs> It'll be closer to 2000. Probably, especially as we mentioned this on the podcast and whatever else, you can have more people. They'll have to check the show notes because we'll include the link. And oh, now cool. I don't want to participate because honestly, what I, what's appealing about it is it's an easy ask. It's not a big piece. It's not complicated. You don't have to overthink it. For, what is it? Four by four? You said four inches by four. By four. four. And people write right and say, should I frame it? Should I put it on campus? Nope, just pop it in a regular envelope. So it's very accessible very. Technic technique. We've had, ch we've had children do it. We've had accomplished artists whose work I love do it. So it's very egalitarian. Like everybody gets to do it. Everyone's gonna have their work on equal footing with artists from around the world. We've got submissions so far from about 15 or 16 countries. Wow. Oh, I so, love um, that. I know it's such a feeling. Right there in my backyard and I wasn't even paying attention. See, this is the thing about social media. We see things, we scroll, we stop sometimes, but we don't always read everything that's available. And I follow you and I love your work. There's I'm so much out there by your work, but like, did I notice that you were doing this? No. <laughs> well, now you do. <laughs> now I do. See, but that is the thing that I hope people realize that we just things go so fast on social media that we miss it. That's why we have to repeat it many times. And you probably have, and I've still missed it, but. Oh, uh, true. I, I actually don't um, post too much about it because I also manage the hospital's Instagram account. So I mainly post it oh, there and you probably yeah. following Georgetown hospital, understandably, but, um, but it's true. There's, there's also so much interesting work out there to look at that. I mean, we only have so many hours of the day we can devote to scrolling Instagram. So it is easy to miss things. And it's great to have some in-depth looks at what people are doing. Yeah, I think that might be why I love podcasts so much is because it's actually a slow connection rather than a quick connection. So yeah. I really enjoyed this medium a lot. And then I get to know artists, even artists that are neighbors to me. So tell <laughs> me what, <laughs> what was that? Over in DC, you have to come over for a cup of coffee. Well, I would love to, or even to stroll the museums because it's been a while. I mean, it's been pre-pandemic since the last time I went. Oh, and wow. Yeah. Seeing art in person. It's like such an important part of being an yeah. artist, being a human, really, right? Yeah. I would love that. Um, I would love to know more about your journey. Like, I love your art. You have really clever and intriguing ideas. Like, I scroll through and I'm like, oh, I love how she put that together. I'm really excited for your summit lesson. But tell me about your art journey. So I did study art as an undergraduate. And then at a certain point I thought, this is completely impractical. I should get a practical degree. And so I did a fifth year so I could get a degree in English literature. Well, <laughs> I'm not sure that was super practical. I went on to get a master's in art history. I lived in Italy for 25 years, which was um, a great place to learn to cook, learn how to drive and have access to Rome's amazing flea market, which is right near my house. So I would have all these really cool papers that just cost you know, nothing, you know, 18th century Italian letters and engravings. Oh. And I've always loved paper and collage um, from the time I was an undergrad. It actually goes even back further, but I was a university administrator while I, for an American university while I lived in Rome, but I always made sure that I made time to make art and I would always have friends over and have what we called art days. And so when I fell in love with someone who lived in DC and after 25 years moved back to the US, I thought, 
what am I going to do? I can't possibly be a university administrator anymore. You know, my cell phone was on 365 days, 24 hours for student emergencies. So I wanted something totally different. And I started out by volunteering um, at a local contemporary art museum um, in Arlington, Virginia, just across the river. So I helped hang in exhibitions. And that sort of allowed me to get to know a whole community of great women who are working in the arts and doing outreach. And I started teaching classes for kids. And then I morphed into teaching classes for adults. And now it's been a decade. And I've loved it. But I think that everything influences everything else. So teaching kids has kept me um, trying to be spontaneous and playful and use, you know, sort of fun colors and repeating shapes that are really accessible. And I teach online for the hospital. I'm a paid artist in residence, not a, a volunteer. But my my participants are all over the world and I can't count on them having a lot of art supplies. I don't, I don't know what, you know, I usually have a class of about a hundred people. Um, I teach the same wow. class twice a week. So I reach a lot of people. And my thing is, is whatever I make, you can make it with whatever art materials you bring to the table. So that keeps things loose and playful and super accessible. So that, so what I've ended up doing has influenced my own art for sure. Well, for sure, because that means like whatever paper is on hand, you need glue and almost everyone has pencils on hand. So it's like, you know, where do you resource the paper? I, my my junk mail is a great source for, for paper. Absolutely. <laughs> and I tell people, they think, oh, I don't have like special collage glue and a great source of papers. And I said, actually, you can use your junk mail, mail order catalogs, wrapping paper. Um, and so I often make collages with whatever is currently on my desk because I mm-hmm. always have paper scraps on my desk. Yeah. And um, it's just sort of a fun lesson to keep it loose, keep it fun. Um, which is why the topic of this um, virtual art summit is so great because I really concentrate on fun and accessible. Yeah. Play is really like the main reason why we want to be making art all the time. Right. Yep. Ever since the pandemic, that's when the hospital started having these classes and people would write to me and say, it's amazing. The time I spend in your art class, I'm not thinking about the anxiety I feel about COVID or loneliness or um, isolation, you know, it's just been, a, I've realized what a great way it is for people to deal with all kinds of situations. So, so are the, the people who are joining you for these, you find them through the hospital, are they just the public in general or are they connected to the hospital somehow? Originally, we just um, sent out a, a mailing to people who had some affiliation with the hospital, which meant most of them were cancer survivors or people in dealing with cancer currently. But then we realized that for the same amount of effort, I could actually teach a much bigger class. I have assistants in class, so mm-hmm. someone who handles the chat and the questions. And it actually works out. It sounds like it would be too big, but we've created this sort of big community and we opened it up to basically anyone who wants to sign up. And so there's, there is this core of people who are affiliated with the hospital or are local. But now we, we had a woman yesterday in class who said, I'm gonna go, I'm really tired. I'm in India and it's midnight. <laughs> You should go then. Um, but so now it definitely reaches uh, a much broader audience. That's but the name of the class is De-Stress with Art, Creativity Jumpstart, De-Stress. So it definitely appeals to people who are feeling stressed out for some reason and thinking, that's what I mean. I need to, I need to try art to, um, <laughs> to chill. But, a bit. but it works too. That's the thing. I mean, I, I've heard this story over and over and over again, especially from 2020 on, is how much it's helped really save people's well-being. So it makes sense. I was like, what's the connection with the hospital and making art? But art is therapeutic. Art is healing. Art is nurturing. Art is playful. So it's all the things that make us feel better. We got to reduce those cortisol levels so that we can, you know, little healthier, right? (laughs) Yep. No, it's just been reinforced again and again. And now I've been teaching these classes, well, since the beginning of the pandemic. And they're still going strong. The hospital also realized it's a great way to make known what they do. This arts and humanities program is a, is a robust one. They've got 15 artists on, on staff and now everyone knows about it. We hear about you know other people doing arts and healthcare. So it's been a, a win-win for everyone. Okay, now let's go back a little time to Italy because I don't know many people who've lived overseas. I got to live overseas for a short time for less than four years. And right. I lived in Belgium, Southern Belgium in the French speaking part. And I'm obsessed with all things like Italy, Europe, France, Germany, the Netherlands. Like I just, I love, I probably should have just done what you did and moved there and lived there for life. But (laughs) I still had responsibilities with kids wanting to come back to the U S to go to school. So um, maybe one day I'll, I'll return again. Uh, In fact, I keep dreaming about that, but the paper 
for me and probably for you as well, it's like, you know, it's not in English. It's not American stuff. It's like, and it's really old oftentimes. So I'd love to hear just like you said, you're near the, the flea markets, near the antiques. And really, honestly, there's treasures to be found. Do you still have some? What was like the catalyst to inspire you into collage with that? You know, I think I've always, I always did collage, even when I, um, like my mom started me collaging as a kid by cutting up magazines and giving me paste. So I've always been drawn to collage. I loved it even in art school. Um, I think there are these vendors in, in Rome where they have tables of vintage paper and books and postcards and photos. And I just thought that having a piece of paper that sort of spoke so much of nostalgia and time and history for an art historian, it just looks so beautiful and so, um, so rich that, and then I realized that, you know, the guy who sells the paper, I got to know him on a first name basis. And I'd say, come on, who's buying this paper? I'm buying like half sheets of weird things because I'm going to use them in collages. So he would give me terrific discounts because usually the paper would cost one euro a piece, which right. still is much. But, um, but I would get, you know, a good deal and get a whole wad of paper. And then every time I go, I still have some because I haven't worked through all of it. Right. Um, sometimes I would just get things that would be good for backgrounds or just sort of interesting like letters. Um, but when I go back, I almost all always plan to be in Rome on a Sunday so I can go back to the flea market. So I was back in December, my guy, I said, where are all your letters and stuff? And he said, I didn't bring them today. And I said, I can't, I should have like been in touch with you. He just had postcards and books, but I still, I got a bunch. So you get to go back regularly. I try, I mean, I hadn't, I've only been back once since the pandemic, but before that I actually led tours to Italy for a while, um, like five art and food and culture tours, which have been really fun. Oh, I do you have work, any? Though. It's a lot of work. Do you have any intention of bringing that back again? Because I might nudge you for a trip to Italy. <laughs> I know I have. The problem is now that I don't know somehow since COVID and since not doing it for these years, I have so many people who want to go. So when I do another one, I think I'm going to need to do like two or three back to back so they're not too big and I can accommodate everybody. I would like to do another one. I just feel like for a long time, I didn't want to do them. I was afraid that with COVID, there would be problems with people not coming and me arguing with, you know, hotels about deposits and stuff. So I thought, oh, well, just wait till that's no longer a concern. I think we're finally getting to that phase. I think so. I think yeah. So I, I was able to start traveling again last year. It was It's hard to not travel when you're used to it, but it's also now hard to get out of my house when I've gotten so comfortable here. I know. <laughs> I feel like I'm a different person. Minutes. I'm so happy hanging out at home now. And also I'm so lucky that I have, my studio is in a little carriage house behind our house. So it's this sort of little oasis that during the pandemic, I just basically would hang out here all the time. And my classes all pivoted to being online. So yeah. my whole world just sort of shrunk into the size of my studio. But we have, my husband and I have traveled and I know that people are traveling more easily and more willingly. So yes, an Italy tour is in my future, I'm sure. Right, we still need to see each other in person. I think that's calling a lot of us. Yeah, We're really comfortable here being at home and meeting on screens, which I'm very grateful for because I've stayed completely social over the last four years. Like three years, feels like eternity. Anyhow, the last three years, it's been completely social and thanks to, you know, video, but we kind of need that energy of being around each other. When you get to make art around other people, it like really feeds the soul, it feeds the community and it, and it helps spark new ideas the way that like online doesn't quite do. Yeah, I know I love being able to sort of look around a table and see how things are progressing in different people's work. And I've been teaching occasional classes online for the Museum of Contemporary Art in Arlington, um, where I've been teaching on and off for 10 years, but certainly less than I've been teaching online. Yeah. I still teach kids in person. And um, I actually love sort of being uh, influenced by their art as well. It's always, most of the kids I teach are under 12. And so they tend to have that sort of wonderful spontaneity and looseness that I think all of us grown up artists strive for. For real, like they don't really, they, they're in the process. They're the epitome of play and not yep. thinking about a finished product. And yep. so, so what's some of the most unusual found papers and products that you or your, all of your students, you know, like when you're like encouraging them to use what they have and not worry about having to buy artist materials because every, to an art, to a real artist at art, everything is a material that you can use. Yeah. In your work. Oh, people, people bring all kinds of interesting things into play. In my online classes, I always joke about people getting an award for the most curious material of the day. This week, someone said they just, I can't remember why, but they decided to do their work of art 
on a flattened out aluminum foil baking pan, which they then colored with Sharpies. So they sort of incised the lines. They decided they didn't want to work on paper. They wanted it. To, oh, I know. We were doing a project inspired by Mary Blair's illustrations for Disney at Castles. And they said they wanted theirs to be all glittery. So they did theirs on aluminum. And I thought, yeah. that's original. But I've had people use, you know, cut up straws, toothpicks. They'll, you know, combine in their collage, whatever things they have. It's really fun to see. And what I do is I, I try to encourage them to take photos of their work and to upload them so that we can all see them better. Even though we can't see them in the process of being made, we can see them online and then we start each class by going over the previous week's artwork very fun so any advice you can give on play well you just said it i always tell people don't focus too heavily on the final product a lot of times you think making art is all about making something that's sort of beautiful and meets some image you have in your mind of a finished product and if you can sort of let go of that and let it be about experimenting and process and having fun with your materials you will, you will find more of an original feeling and spontaneity and, and it's a better way to find your own direction than it is by trying slavishly to get something to look the way you thought maybe it should look. So when I give um, project creative prompts for my classes, I try to keep them very loose and encourage them, now you take it in whatever direction appeals to you. And I think sometimes people think, I wanna to be told exactly what to do. Well, yeah, you know, you need to, you need to have fun, play, you know, be playful, be experimental, because I think experimenting is the key. And that's yeah. you give them the prompt, the starting point where they go with that. I wonder how often you run into people, like you said, they they want the exact directions. It's like, am I doing it right? <laughs> like I'm sure you hear hear that, but when I teach, I hear people say that, am I doing it right? I'm like, if you're doing it, you're doing it right. <laughs> yeah, you know? fortunately, they I think I've um I've I've taught them not to say that, not to say that with me because they know I I sort of repeat incessantly you know take it in your own direction take make the project your own so. yeah for sure okay I'm gonna ask you one of my favorite questions to ask everyone and um, I think this is when we can get into our most playful spirit what is your big audacious dream well I guess big is relative like maybe someone else would think that's big I would love to have the time to um, turn a series of my own art into cards. But I um, I want somehow to have words that go with the images and I'm not a very good word person. And so I've always thought, oh, if I had like an artist residency, I could just sit and I could work on this and not let, you know, all the other things I do creep in. Um, something along those lines, I think would be fun. So you need an artist residency where you can just be. <laughs> and, make, and I'm assuming when you say make a series of cards, you're probably thinking of being able to have reproductions of them yeah right, right, right. things yeah. That, I, that i would like to reproduce and yeah i think your designs would lend really well to that and many other does many other like products i could see on journals or or whatnot that would be a lot of fun it'd be fun yeah but i do feel like i'm always good at sort of keeping making things because i'm always making things in my classes and with my students and participants but it's really hard to find the time to just stop and then um work on elaborating something for a specific purpose yeah, I'm with you. I struggle with that too. Oftentimes my art making is really directed by the lessons that I'm teaching. And, yeah. I, and I oftentimes will like get into a playful mode with it and stumble upon an idea and then not have enough time to just explore it deeper. And exactly. so- I'm always like making those like, oh, remember when you have time, go back. <laughs> I was playing with fluorescence and black the other day and it was so much fun and I haven't had time to pick it up again. And now I'm on to the next project I need to work on. So maybe that's what we'll um, encourage everyone at the Virtual Arts Summit is to do it and then do it again and then see where it takes you and do it again and set aside some actual time to play. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jennifer. It was so fun to connect. And I do hope to make it to DC sooner than later in this beautiful spring weather that we're having. Yeah, well, if you do, you know, let me know and maybe we can yeah, meet up and see an exhibit together. I would love that. Thank you so much. It's good to meet you and see you and take care.